Okay. So, Hola. Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone again. So, as I said before, we had more than 200 people connected following this seminar. So, no pressure for the panelists. So, I mean, there is a great expectation in getting to know your beautiful science and your game changing research projects. We have seen before, and this is quite interesting and was of one of the main goals of this, uh, of this webinar, connections and cross-pollinization between projects that actually didn't know each other before this panel. So we are lots of groups, research groups, researchers, academics, scientists working all together in COVID all coming from different backgrounds, different universities, different hospitals. And I think it's a great experience that we are working all together today, um, trying to push forward the research for finding a cure, finding a vaccine, finding uh, new solutions, diagnostics, etc. So today our, in this panel, we have uh, the vaccines panel and the chairman of this panel is going to be uh, Monte Daban, uh, Head of International Relations and Advisor for Research of the Secretariat of Universities of the uh, Research Enterprise and Research Ministry of the Generalitat de Catalunya. Monse, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jordi. Uh, it's a pleasure to chair this session today on behalf of the General Director for Research, the Ministry of Business and Knowledge. And also, you know, on his behalf, I'd like to recall uh, very quickly a call that is open, which is called Resilience for Growth. And it's open to all fields and to all issues related to the global and local impact for COVID-19. This is addressed to universities, circular research centers, and outstanding large infrastructures. So thank you for allowing me just to mention this open call that can be, I think that it might be of interest to the groups presenting today and also to the attendees to this session. So now, um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce next session speakers. So we'll start uh, with Dr. Jorge Garrillo from IRSI Caixa, Dr. Cristina Furnaguera from Institut Químic de Sarrià, Dr. Julia Prado from IRSI Caixa, Institut de Recerca Germans Trias i Pujol, Dr. Narcis Saudí from Valdebron Institut de Recerca, DIR, and Dr. Pere Jean Cardona from Institut de Recerca Germans Trias i Pujol. So, before that, also let me recall you that your participation is very important. Help us choose the winner of the two awards, starting now, Most Beautiful Science and the Game Changer work. And you should do it according to your colleague pitches, but also what you see beyond the awards. And also help us guess which vaccine will be first approved by the European Medicines Agency. So, um, Dr. Carrillo, the floor, is, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Um, I would like to thank to the organizer for, for giving me the opportunity to present our result here. Uh, I would like to say that, that we are working in the development of a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, but we think that in parallel to this work that we are doing, uh, it's very, very important to understand how the immune system is working against this virus because all this information can, can give us uh, important tool to refine the, the vaccine that we are developing. With this aim, we have performed a characterization of the human response in this in COVID-19 patient. And as you can see here in the graph uh, that I'm showing, um, we, we develop a, a set of ELISA that allow us to, uh, to analyze the human response against different antigens from this virus. Um, what we, we observed was that we can detect uh, all main three isotypes, the IgM, the IgG, and the IgA targeting different antigens from this virus in almost all the patients that we, we analyzed. But this, for this first uh, analysis, we can identify that uh, the S2 and also the RBD show some advantages in this serology test because they show the high sensitivity to identify the patient that were infected with this, with this virus. Something that was surprised, for, at, at least for me, at this point, was that we can detect 
there is three isotypes from very early after infection. As you know, the human response work usually work with a first uh, response, mainly dominated by the IgM. And after one week, two weeks, we can start to detecting IgG in the cell. Well, this is not happening here with this virus. We are detecting from the very beginning all these three isotypes, IgM, IgG, and IgA. Can you go to the next slide, please? And this is particularly uh, easy to see here with this correlation analysis where you can see that there is a, st a strong correlation between the old isotype against the older antigen that we have evaluated in this, in this ELISA. And also there is also a, a strong association between the, the antigen that are targeted by these antibodies. You can see in the, in the panel on the right that there is a nice correlation between the, in the IgM response again, the difference of union of the spike indicating that the IgM response is a polyclonal response that are targeting the S2, the S1, and also the RBD region in this subunit. But something that was interesting was that when we analyzed the IgG and the IgM response, we can identify some patients that show a bias to the S2 region so, so this result also confirms that the S2 region is a nice antigen to include in this ser uh, serology test because they are, they are uh, increasing the sensitivity of this, of this aside. Something also that was very interesting was that the nice correlation that we can observe for IgM, IgG, and IgA when we analyze the reactivity against the S1 subdomain of the, of the spike and the RBD indicating that most of the antibodies that are targeting this N-terminal region of the spike are actually targeting the RBD region. As you know, uh, um, most of the neutralizing antibodies that have been identified today are targeting the region because the region is the responsible to, you, to, to bind to the AC2 receptor on the surface of the cells. So as you can see here, uh, IgM, IgG, and IgA are uh, recognizing this the region. By this, we want also to analyze. Could, could you please go to the next slide? To do, um, according to the result, we were interested also to analyze uh, what was the, the dynamic in appearance of the antibody that are neutralizing the virus. To do, to do, to analyze what we perform a, a neutralization aside. And we can observe that most of the COVID patients are developing neutralizing antibody uh, very early after infection. About 10 days after symptom onset, we can detect in most of the patients uh, neutralizing antibodies. And something also that was very, very interesting for us because, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are interested in the development of vaccine against the SARS-CoV-2. Some, some researchers show that uh, those patients that are suffering from a severe form of this disease, they are developing high titer of total antibody against the spike or other antigen and also high titer of neutralizing antibodies. And from this result, from this work, uh, the researchers uh, suggest that uh, maybe the human response can play a role in, in, this, in this severity form of the disease. So we perform a, a correlation analysis and our results show that there, are no, uh, there is no a clear association between the titer of neutralizing or total antibody against different antigens from the virus and the severity of the disease. Have like 10 seconds, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about so that. Could, could you please go to the last? In this last slide, you can see the conclusion of this work that I, I have mentioned uh, during the presentation. And finally, I would like to thank all the people that are forming part of this consortia, the CEBIC consortia. Of course, I, I would like to send to, the, to our sponsors and all the people that are contributing to our research through the Jome Corona crowdfunding initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. We go really fast to Cristina Fornaguera. And just let me tell you that it's, we are like uh, 30 minutes late, but it's fine. We will take our time to listen to all our panelists. So please, Cristina. Okay, thank you very much. So, good afternoon. Today I will present you our COVID Nanovax project. Next, please. Uh, which is a project that has been that was funded by the express goal of the Instituto de Salud Carlos III. And as you will see, we are we are a group of materials in, in 
Engineering here at IQS, Institute of Chemistry of, of Sarria in Barcelona. And um, this is a project in collaboration with the University of Cali. You will see that our point of, of or, or, or knowledge or, or expertise is very different from, from all other presentations, but I would like during these five minutes to convince you that this is an outstanding research and that will become a game changer technology. Why? Because it's related with nanomedicine. Next, next please. And um, why nanomedicine, it, it could be a game changer, changer technology. First, because it, because it can improve the safety of the treatment. We, uh, I will show you that we are, tr um, we are trying to, to develop, as it is written in here, an mRNA vaccine based on polymeric nanoparticles to prevent this COVID-19 infection. Using this mRNA as an antigen and using targeted nanoparticles, you will see how effective this treatment can be. Next, please. But let's go, uh, uh, let's take a look deeper in the project. As you can see here, and as I just told you, we are developing a, a, a vaccine which is based on an, on an antigenic mRNA, of course encoding for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, that will be encapsulated inside our proprietary polymers. In fact, our, uh, our expertise is in the design of biomaterials, so we have a library of oligopeptide and modified polybeta amino esters that, thanks to their cationic charges, can complex the negatively charged nucleic acid and form these COVID nanobacs. These particles will be targeted specifically to dendritic cells, so we can achieve uh, that they selectively recognize these cells to achieve nanoparticle endocytosis and make that mRNA is expressed only in the cells to achieve antigen presentation and this antigen-specific immune response. With so, we want to generate the immunological memory required to protect patients against the SARS-CoV-2 infection. We have designed the following methodology to, to achieve this project. First, the mRNA antigen needs to be selected, as well as the most uh, appropriate polyvitamino ester from our library. Then, we need to formulate our nanoparticles to further demonstrate their proof of concept in, in vitro assays and finally perform preclinical and clinical development. So the main milestones of the project to be achieved are the first one to, to, to select which are the, the, the antigens to, to, of election. We, we have selected B anti epitopes to achieve an overall response, um, and this has been done by, by using the S1 uh, uh, fraction of the spike protein. Then we have selected, as I, I just told you, the, uh, the proprietary polymers that selectively transfect dendritic cells to achieve the antigen presentation and the memory generation. So the final goal of our project, as all of you, is the COVID-19 prevention. Now I would like to share with you our preliminary results that we have already. That we have already. We have demonstrated that we are able to formulate these nanoparticles and that they are appropriate for the parenteral administration. They have sizes below 200 nanometers, a low polydispersity, and a cationic surface charge that will enable their interaction with the cell. And one of the most important points is that this high encapsulation efficiency that you see in this slide. We achieved that more than 80% of the mRNA is effective. So in terms of production process, we will, achieve to, to, we will be able to, uh, to, to design a, a, a highly efficient biomanufacturing process. We have also already demonstrated that we are able to in vitro transfect very efficiently dendritic cells among other antigen presenting cells by using a reporter gene. I interrupt you one minute. Yes, sure. Um, in, in vivo studies, um, next please, uh, you can see here that all particles are exclusively accumulated in the spleen and specifically, next, in the, in the dendritic, in the antigen presenting cells of the spleen. Next please. Next. So uh, at which point are we in our project right now? We are, uh, we are performing the preclinical study. In fact, we have already immunized mice and we are waiting for the results. And we expect that in the next year, we will be able to confirm the safety and generation of neutralizing antibodies to in clinical studies. Before finishing, I would like to acknowledge um, Biocat for giving us the opportunity to present our work in this seminar and all of you for your attention. Thanks. Well, thank you. Perfect timing. Now we have Julia Prado from your Sikasha and IGTP. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to thank the committee for the Chasing COVID session to, to select this work for presentation uh, in this vaccine session. And also I would like to acknowledge all of our, our collaborations across the different institutes and our funding that has this project is currently supported by the Department of Health in Catalonia and also the Carlos III uh, Institute of Health. So our project is based on the idea uh, that current cov immune analysis and vaccine development are heavily biased by numerous potential erroneous assumptions, just because we don't know yet enough about the functional correlates of protection and the cross-reactivity between stress. So our project basically aims to test with high-resolution T-cell immunity in an unbiased manner against the entire coronavirus 2 proteome. Uh, we can do that because we count with the existing availability of unique and extensive course of coronavirus to infected and uninfected individuals. Uh, please go to the, yeah, thank you. And can leverage with Telnic as a back cells developed in our lab for vaccine design. In fact, our team unifies uh, medical staff at the forefront of medical care for COVID-19 patients, well-established immunologists with experts uh, in antiviral immunity and our status are research centers that has the necessary infrastructure to conduct the plan analysis. So uh, we have approached uh, this project uh, through a stable high resolution immune mapping of the whole coronavirus 2 proteome. And since April, uh, and the pa paper was recently published in August 2020, we have been able to design more than 2,800 peptides that they will cover the whole uh, coronavirus 2 proteome. But this is a challenge for the for the for the scientific community to understand immunology behind 30,000 base per uh, virus. So we are currently running uh, this high resolution immunomapping, and we are seeing that not all the response are spiked. So what else we need to protect against a uh, coronavirus? At the same time, we are profi uh, profiling single cells uh, for protective uh, responses by improved a proprietary boosted flow cytometry and single cell transcriptomics. And this is not possible. I think this is something to highlight in this project uh, that, that we have an existing sample base for access to units and large longitudinal cords. Uh, is the PROEPIC uh, corda study that will be presented by Dr. Concha Villan in session four that allow, will allow us to have a big data, database and integrative analysis. That means high number of individuals, identification of rare phenotypes, and a follow-up, not only the first wave of infection, but also the second wave of infection. Um, and last but not least, uh, I would like you to convince you why this project has a high impact, uh, not only in the scientific uh, aspect because we think that we can contribute to the definition of protective immunity against coronavirus too, but in terms of innovation through the development of diagnostic tools to address coronavirus to immunity across courts and also reproductively testing for vaccine prototypes, not only one vaccine prototype, but all the vaccine prototypes, we will ask whether we are uh, enhancing and inducing T cell responses. And socially, uh, these new vaccine prototypes that we will be able to inform with our studies uh, will have the aim to achieve a high degree of protection in the population. So why you should vote for our project? Uh, because we think we can accelerate science and innovation uh, through the second generation of a coronavirus to vaccine prototypes to optimize protection in the population. And also because we believe that we can contribute to a paradigm shift that it will be to characterize population heart immunity, not only uh, by limited by the limited information that we are taking for the serological yeah. tests, yeah. but also supplementing or replacing it. Thanks for your time. And that's all. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I jumped when you were just uh, finishing. So uh, thank you for being so brief also, and thank you for being so clear. So let's recall that all our colleagues here are competing for uh, Beautiful Science and Game Changers. So please take your, I mean, take their presentations in mind and scroll down. Remember to scroll down uh, to, to vote all the possible mod modalities that are uh, available. So, sorry, and don't hate me for cutting you, sorry, <laughs> because of that. Uh, now we jump to the next one, Narcisse Saoui from Valdebron, please. Yes, first, let's confirm that the microphone is working. 
Is the audio working? Yes. Is it working? Yeah. Yes. So thanks. So first, thanks to the organizers to invite us to present our project, COVID Back, a fusion inhibition vaccine design model for SARS-CoV vaccine. And uh, let's take 30 seconds to thank to to, to send the, the participants. That's a uh, way that's making a terrific job in the lab and Dr. Joseph, the, the PI, and also collaborators, uh, Josep, Francesca, and Paco from the liver disease in our institute, Dr. Oliva from Pompeo Fabra, and Rogier and Quinton from Amsterdam. So since uh, last December, the SARS-CoV virus is, uh, is all over, just causing the COVID pandemic. Uh, a lot has been said about this virus. I only want to mention that it's an enveloped virus. And this is important because our vaccine is based on that, the interaction with the membrane. Since then, more than 200 vaccine candidates have been developed, making use of all kinds of vaccine models, uh, protein subunits, inactivated viruses, recombinant viral vectors, RNA, DNA, and most of them are directed against the full, either full virus, full spike, S1, or the receptor binding domain only. But our candidate is targeted against the S2 subdomain. And as a kind of summary, and making a bit of a spoiler of the vaccine, let's say that our vaccine model is based on a chimeric human papilloma virus like particle. The immunogen we use is heptad repeat two and one from the S2 subunit. And the idea is to elicit antibodies against this region that binds to R2 and heptad repeat two and heptad repeat one so that it prevents uh, fusion. Next, please. Why we have selected S2 as a target and HR2 as the first candidate? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus and it has a membrane. And so that, that the infection goes over, we need that this membrane of the virus enters in contact with the membrane of the cell and th they fuse and they, the, the viral contents can go into the cell. So to make this, uh, the, the, the virus uses type one fusion mechanism that's located in the S S2 subunit here we can see this uh, alpha helix that are the heptad repeats that perform this uh, fusion. Here we can see in, in yellow that when the res uh, receptor binding domain interacts with the cellular receptors, there's a change, this triggers a structural change in the spike protein and the alpha helix to alpha, the heptad repeat two alpha helix moves to join the three uh, heptad repeat ones to form a six helix bond bundle. This drives cellular and viral members to fuse and form a pore so that nucleocapsid can enter the cytoplasm. The FTRP2 sequence of the fusion core is really conserved sequence and it's very similar between SARS-CoV-1, 2, MERS and other coronaviruses. Uh, it has been described that peptides mimicking HR2 can be used as a pan-coronavirus interfering peptides. So, and this is what we expect that the antibodies that we have elicited uh, jo uh, bind to after repeat two or after repeat one, and this prevents the change in the structure and prevents fusion. Next, please. And how are we going to perform that? As mentioned, we use uh, a successful, safe, and effective vaccine, that's human papilloma virus, that's a virus like particle. If you synthesize the L1 protein, this L1 protein falls into pentamers and the pentamers assemble into BLPs. We have inserted the certain residues of the HR2 fusion core into the EF loop of the L1 uh, protein so that it's highly exposed. When the L1, the chimeric L1 falls and assembles into BLPs, we're going to have 360 times uh, exposed this sequence and highly exposed on the surface of the BLP. Next, please. And this is a, a molecular model of how the HR2 uh, alpha helix is going to be presented in the L1 protein. This model has been performed by our collaborators in Pompeo Fabra and in Amsterdam. And next, uh, several advantages of our vaccine model is that BLPs are more immunogenic than soluble proteins. 
uh, the vaccine vector we use, the HPV VLP, is a safe vaccine vector, and it's uh, already licensed, and the large-scale production has already been optimized. Also, we make sure that we have a high exposure of the HR2 sequence, 360 times and on the surface of the BLP. Uh, also, L1 protein and HP, uh, human papillomavirus has mucosotropism, so it can elicit uh, mucosal immunity. And also, the antibodies that perform this uh, fusion inter uh, interference uh, offer long-term protection as compared to the interfering peptides that I mentioned before. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. And now uh, we move to the last one in this block, Pera Joan Cardona. The floor is yours, Pera. Hi, thank you very much. And thank you very much for choosing our project. I would like to thank also the um, um, Department of Health of the Generalitat of Catalonia for uh, funding this project. I would like to show you or to, um, yes, to, to, to show the to explain a nice story about uh, this project, uh, which is that we are going to do a clinical assay with a, a, a TB vaccine. Uh, this TB vaccine is the called RUTI, that is made by fermented um, and liposome fragments of M tuberculosis. And this has been done thanks to the collaboration with uh, uh, EDF Jordi Gol, uh, with uh, Dr. Concha Violan and Dr. Pere Turan. And we are also working with uh, Dr. Maria Rosa Sarrias uh, from the Innate Response Lab in the IGTP. So the idea is to use a vaccine, a TB vaccine against uh, COVID, uh, which uh, at the first view you could say, what uh, what's what this is about? Uh, so uh, we have been seeing a, a nice science about very specific um, approaches to to destroy the the virus and um, and the or to, to block the receptors. So the, here we are talking about something very uh, different. Next, next one, please. So. Um, this comes uh, for the need that we are uh, in a sort of run to have a very specific vaccine. So here we um, we give another opportunity, an opportunity to uh, to have a sort of of uh, uh, broad uh, and, and a specific broad spectrum vaccine against several uh, agents, pathogen agents, included COVID. And this comes from idea uh, from the idea of the BCG. A vaccine, which is the old vaccine against tuberculosis, has shown uh, uh, that in the countries, that next one that has been uh, is still used, um, you have a really low uh, uh, impact of COVID, both in incidence and morbidity. So in this case, what we offer is the Ruti vaccine, which uh, has shown that has a very uh, a nicer uh, profile than BCG. BCG is uh, m bobby's attenuated um, Bacillus, so can have some problems, especially in immunosuppressive people. So in this regard, uh, our um, vaccine is an activated one and has a better profile. Next one. So here, next, yes. So the idea here is that, next one, please. So uh, the mechanism of this, why BCG is working, uh, in, and in fact is uh, now is running a, a big trial to, to test that, is that induces this uh, trait, what is known as trinity immunity, which is that is a sort of different immunity. We usually uh, think about antibodies or T cell, T lymphocytes, specific lymphocytes. But in this case, what we do is uh, induce a sort of uh, memory immunity in monocytes. So that the first cells that goes to uh, infectious loci. And uh, what we have seen, uh, we had, has been demonstrated is that the BCG vaccination induced this epigenetic modification, so this modification of histones that allows um, a quicker response of monocytes uh, once they arrive to the uh, infectious fossil, so reducing um, the load of pathogens. So next one. So here is our the design of our clinical trial. So we are go, we are going to recruit these 315 uh, professionals that we were, uh, are working in two hospitals in the Hospital Germán de Cujol and Hospital uh, um, uh, São Paulo. The idea is to the the ratio is two to one. 
from rooting to placebo. We are going to evaluate the infection and the reduction of infection and morbidity. And also we are going to evaluate in a sub-study the induction of trinity immunity in this sub-study of uh, 60 people, which are now uh, finalizing. So we have uh, validated uh, in a previous uh, trial with uh, non-vaccinated volunteers, we, are, uh, we have validated uh, how to perform it how to make, to, to perform the analysis of trained immunity in the lab of uh, Dr. Asarias. So this is all. Thank you very much. Next one. So the idea here, uh, the final concept is that RUTI will become a sort of basic wardrobe uh, vaccine for not only for uh, COVID, if the uh, specific vaccine takes some time to to, to, to be discovered, but also for future pandemics. So in order not to be in such a, in this, in this sort of, oh, sorry. Uh, in this uh, sort of um, susceptibility, global susceptibility against a new agent. So this could be a sort of vaccine to be administered at the first time while a uh, more specific vaccine uh, is designed and is, uh, is, effic is efficacious. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pere Joan, and thank you, Jorge, Cristina, Julia, and Narcisse as well for your um, speeches, for your pitches, and also for being so um, straight to the point and, in, and for, for trying to compete for these awards. So don't let's not forget that there's a there are two polls ongoing now. We have one poll going on all the time and the polls for our colleagues that will all be, only be open now, I understand, for some minutes. So we, Team Vaccines, need to make our winners, the whole contest winners. So please go ahead and vote for those beautiful projects and game changer projects that we have heard today. So uh, now moving forward, I don't know if there are some questions in the, um, in the chat. But I, I would like to ask a couple of general questions for you to, 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 to uh, answer very quickly because and understand that it's uh, not a long time we have to follow this discussion. So, but we see that the array of vaccines that now are under development, there are like 44 on clinical and like uh, 150 something uh, in preclinical. Uh, there are different kinds of vaccines. You just uh, showed some of the, these types in your in your presentations. These are the mRNA vaccines, the virus-like particle-based vaccines, the protein or proteome vaccines, like you you explained also. So we also see that these different kinds of vaccines have strengths and weaknesses, and also strengths and weaknesses linked to the response that they induce, the quality, the durability, and also the number of deliveries, for example. So I want you very quickly to defend if, um, or, or to just answer which is your, your position on that regard, the, the strength and the, in just one word, the strength and the weakness of your, of your proposal. Over the others. <laughs> uh, let me start with our model. The strength is that, that it uses an already known uh, backbone, that's a human papilloma virus, that's safe and efficacious. And uh, weakness, well, it has quite a bit of uh, downstream processing to get the, 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 the vaccine. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, on our side, I think a strength is uh, long-term T cell immunity. Uh, so we will challenge the virus and control the virus every time that it comes. Uh, another strength, uh, it comes through uh, cross-reactivity. So we will be protected uh, with against other virus. And weakness at the moment that we need more basic knowledge uh, and it will take a little bit longer to generate this second prototype for a higher protection. Thank you. Christina, for example. Okay, thanks. Um, I think that the, the strength, the main strength of our, of our approximation is the versatility. I mean, even if we have already selected the antigens to be encapsulated, we can adapt our, our prototype to, to, to encapsulate other antigens. And since the particles by themselves would be very similar independently on the mRNA that, en, the, that encodes, this pro, the, this, this, these changes on the formulation um, are not highly time consuming. 
On the other hand, the weakness of our system could be maybe that our proprietary polymers are not yet um, accepted uh, or validated for human use. But we have performed a lot of regulator, uh, a lot of um, tests in, in other projects that we have before to arrive to, to clinical studies. Thank you. Jorge, for example. Sorry, I have no present data about the, the vaccine that we are developing right now. We, uh, I have uh, only showed data about the natural human response in, in, in this SARS-CoV-2 infected individual. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, for our result and for many other researchers that are doing a similar study that the development of neutralizing antibodies seem not to be a very, uh, much, uh, very important handicap in this infection. So most of the individuals are going to de develop neutralizing antibodies targeting this RBD region and probably other regions that are not characterized yet in the, in the S2 region. Uh, um, and to me, the, probably the, the, the major point that is going to be uh, different in, in between the different platforms of the vaccine that are running right now is the durability of the immune response that they are going to generate and also the safety issue associated with, the, or with this vaccine. And I guess uh, in our case, uh, our strengths are that this is a product that is ready to use. We have already done uh, phase one and phase two uh, clinical trials in and TB infected people and TB patients. So it has a very nice uh, profile. We have a discoverability done. So this is, could be really in the market very fast. The other thing is that it could be used as a combination with other specific vaccines. We don't know these uh, new vaccines uh, will have the strength uh, to, to be uh, efficacious enough. Uh, so, and the third is that uh, it's a broad spectrum uh, vaccine. So it's, uh, it is the trained immunity. So this could be also available for other uh, viruses and even other uh, bacteria. On the other hand, the main, the main weakness is that, of course, this is a sort of uh, time-limited um, vaccine in a way that once there will be a, a specific one, we should, in a way, retire. But it, there is also the, the possibility to merge with other specific vaccines. So thank you very much. I just, we will move forward, but before, Let's recall all the voters that you have to scroll down to see the whole screen. And I'm sure that Jordi will mention about the poll on the vaccines for the EMA. Um, so probably he will recall that. So now, please, vaccine team, go vote. Thank you very much for your participation and the best of luck for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.